Welcome to Layer Zero. Layer Zero is a podcast of unscripted conversations with the people that make up the Ethereum community. Crypto is built by code, but it's composed by people, and each individual member of the crypto community has their own story to tell. The cypherpunks understood that the code they write impacts the people that use it, and Layer Zero focuses on the people behind the code, because Ethereum is people all the way down, and always has been. Today on Layer Zero, I'm talking to Amin Soleimani, and I've said his name on the Bankless podcast a number of times before. He's been on the Bankless podcast a number of times before. He helped meme Moloch into existence in 2018 and 2019. He's the creator of Moloch DAO, one of the first DAOs to come out of Ethereum after the DAO. Uh, and he makes this joke about how he made Moloch DAO with you know, w- many purposes, one of them being to help the Ethereum community get over what he calls PTS DAO, as in PTSD over the 2016 DAO that caused the Ethereum classic hard fork. Um, So we we talk about Moloch, coordination, DAOs, and what DAOs can do for the landscape of both Ethereum when it comes to coordination, but also for the broader world. Uh, and, And really why Ethereum is just coordination tools all the way down. But then we get into some broader subjects such as uh, he's, his recent fight against the Federal Reserve uh, and how the Federal Reserve has this relationship with uh, the broader world that is unsavory and, and how we as a people need to resist what is going on with the Federal Reserve. Uh, and Amin has always been a very big patterned thinker, a big philosophical person who can see the biggest patterns that the world has put in front of us and sees them for what they are. And he's a, he's a pretty controversial guy, uh, he, he's pretty sharp around the edges. He's definitely not afraid of uh, putting his foot down and, and making people be very uncomfortable. Uh, so I actually do not recommend that you listen to this episode with kids in the car or you know young ones who aren't ready for very mature subjects. Um, but I, I, even though I mean definitely has his controversies, he's a hero of mine through and through for the way that he thinks and what he thinks about. Uh, and the lessons that he brings to the table, because uh, they're very emblematic of this particular podcast, why I call it Layer Zero. It's because he gets down to the bottom of things uh, in a very fast, uh, sometimes crude, uh, but effective way. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Amin Soleimani, and we'll get to that conversation right after we talk to some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible. Arbitrum is an Ethereum layer two scaling solution that is going to completely change how we use DeFi and NFTs. Some of the coolest new NFT collections have chosen Arbitrum as their home, while DeFi protocols continue to see increased liquidity and usage. You can now bridge straight into Arbitrum from more than 10 different exchanges, including Binance, FTX, Huobi, and Crypto.com. Once on Arbitrum, you'll enjoy fast transactions with cheap fees, allowing you to explore new frontiers of the crypto universe. New to Arbitrum, for a limited time, you can get Arbitrum NFTs designed by the famous artists Ratwell and Sugoi for joining the Arbitrum Odyssey. The Odyssey is an eight week long event where you complete on-chain activities and receive a free NFT as a reward. Find out more by visiting the Discord at discord.gg slash Arbitrum. You can also bridge your assets to Arbitrum at bridge.arbitrum.io and access all of Arbitrum's apps at portal.arbitrum.one in order to experience DeFi and NFTs the way it was always meant to be, fast, cheap, secure, and friction free. The Brave browser is the user-first browser for the Web3 internet, with over 60 million monthly active users. And inside the Brave browser, you'll find the Brave wallet, the secure multi-chain crypto wallet built right into the browser. Web3 is freedom from big tech and Wall Street, more control and better privacy, but there's a weak point in Web3, your crypto wallet. And most crypto wallets are browser extensions, which can easily be spoofed. But the Brave wallet is different. No extensions are required, which gives Brave browser an extra level of security versus other wallets. Brave wallet is your secure passport for the possibilities of Web3, supports multiple chains, including Ethereum and Solana. You can even buy crypto directly inside the wallet with RAMP. And of course, you can store, send, and swap your crypto assets, manage your NFTs, and connect to other wallets and DeFi apps. So whether you're new to crypto or you're a seasoned pro, it's time to ditch those risky extensions and it's time to switch to the Brave wallet. Download Brave at brave.com bankless and click the wallet icon to get started. Juno is bringing crypto-friendly banking straight into your checking account. With Juno, you can send money from your Juno checking account straight onto a layer two, like Polygon, Optimism, Arbitrum, and they have ZK Sync and StarkNet support on their way. You can skip the ACH wait times, you can skip all the gas fees, and go straight from your checking account to an Ethereum layer two in seconds. Inside Juno, you can buy and sell crypto with $0 fees, and your Juno checking account comes with a metal MasterCard that gives you up to 5% cash back on your spending. Juno is also giving you $10 cash back on your 
your first crypto deposit and $100 when you set up a direct deposit. This ad just writes itself. So go sign up at juno.finance slash bankless. What's up, Amin? How's it going? Great. Uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> It's quite the uh, eccentric background you've got there. Yeah, had to fit the unicorn into the picture. <laughs> is that is that a chair that you're on? I uh, yes, this is a this is a nice little pink throny chair thing. <laughs> we'll we'll get into all of that and more. But for for listeners who came in perhaps in 2021 or or, or beyond, the, the most recent cohort of crypto listeners, content consumers. Uh, they might not be as familiar with you as I once was when I first got into this space. Uh, can you explain your perch in the Ethereum and broader crypto ecosystem? What would you say that you do here? Uh, yeah, so I'm the CEO of Spankchain, which was the first uh, one of the first attempts to bring the benefits of crypto to the adult community. Uh, so mm -hmm. from that perch, I get to sort of, you know, it's like a libertarian viewpoint, how to make things useful for everyday people. Uh, you know, not so much like, uh, the, the grander things too, but, uh, yeah, we, <laughs> um, that, that stuff's more about like helping sex workers, uh, you know, use Ethereum tools to keep their money safe. Um and and so forth uh sell nfts and um but we we do some other things too uh we made the first l2 uh spank live <laughs> so that was a mm -hmm. fun opportunity to learn about you know putting l2s in production four years ago uh, a lot of lessons learned that we've been able to use now uh four years later when it's like finally time uh for layer twos um I try to focus on the types of things that people aren't uh, and like where the blind spots were too. So we started Moloch DAO like back in the day. Uh, Ethereum was very utopian and I was mm. uh, concerned that our utopianism uh, wasn't going to like, mm, you know, be very scalable or sustainable forever. So, yeah. Yeah, go into that a little bit more. Uh Ethereum, one of the things that brought me into Ethereum is just how optimistic and perhaps utopian is the right word. Everyone is. It's like it's infectious. Like everyone's really generally happy and accepting. Uh, but but I think perhaps somewhere to our, our own like naiveness, naivete, like when you come into Ethereum and you see like the culture here, what, what do you see? Yeah, I saw a lot of like well-wishing sort of people, right? It's like... Um, uh, we prided ourselves for years about being a very welcoming community, about being very friendly. Uh, and it led to the Ethereum community getting hacked in sort of predictable ways uh, by people who were like, oh, you know, uh, upfront, like very friendly, but then had sort of their own intentions and goals uh, that were maybe not aligned with the Ethereum community. And so uh, a lot of the Kumbaya culture, um, isn't very mm, designed, like well designed around adversarial thinking and things like that. And so, um, the, you know, the idea of like Moloch uh, was very appealing to me uh, because it described these sort of like game theoretic traps uh, where you have to make some sacrifice of something you value because everybody else does. And like Ethereum doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, it would be nice if it did, but like it's still subject to the competitive forces that drive everything else. And so if we want our values uh, of, you know, <clears throat> uh, pro-social and uh, you know, positive sum to expand to the rest of the world, we sort of have to compete to protect them uh, and to advance them uh, against other things that might try to outcompete them that don't have those values. Uh, and I saw a lot of people taking this idea for granted that Ethereum was just like the best. It was going to dominate forever and it was just going to win because we're the good guys. Uh, <laughs> and like in my experience, that's like not how anything works. Um, it's like nice when the good guys win, but it's like typically because they're more powerful than the bad guys. Uh, it's not because they like are nicer than the bad guys. Like, I mean, I don't know. You could make the case that like they could coordinate better. Uh, <laughs> but like... Uh, yeah, that's getting sort of deeper into the subject. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's having watched and you being a leader for me in this space with just like how you think and your writing, uh, it, it seems very appropriate that you are the person to be beating this drum of adversarial thinking of this guy who's like doing this ICO spang chain that like really just like throws people off. And we're just like supposedly doing this very professional thing of trying to build a platform for payment channels. But what do we do with that thing? Oh, we, we apply it to like making sex workers lives like easier. Uh, and then like it, it, you have this like air about you. That's very like, I kind of find like Ethereum aligned in that, uh, we're here to move the needle of humanity, but we're not going to take ourselves too seriously while we do it. Uh, and, and so like, well, this started off as like, you know, what, what am I going to do with this payments technology? I'm going to go like straight into sex work in like 2017. And then like that kind of also, I think also relates to how you interface with like the broader Ethereum community. It was like, oh, everyone is in you know, this like growing the pie mentality, but I'm going to be like the hardliner that enforces like adversarial thinking and thinking of any, everyone as an enemy because all of you people aren't doing that. That's kind of how I like quickly and, and quickly and roughly summarize your activity in the space. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it was, uh, it, it was basically a reaction to the prevailing utopianism that, uh, drove me to embrace the Moloch meme and feel compelled to share it. Um, because I like, it's not like, to be clear, like I like the utopianism, right? I like the aspirational nature of Ethereum. I like the optimism. Uh, I, I think uh, it's important to sprinkle it with a dose of realism. Um, and like, also there's other communities where like the slang Moloch meme wouldn't have worked out uh, because they don't care. So like, you know, maybe in other communities that are less mission oriented and more mercenary, you know, oriented, uh, you know, they don't care about slaying Moloch. They're like, wait, I can trade my values for competitive advantage. Fuck yeah, that sounds great. Let's worship Moloch and do that, right? Uh, is there a point to this whole blockchain stuff that beyond getting ourselves rich? I don't know. Uh, but like, who cares? You know, um, but like, that's not what you feel in Ethereum. What you feel is like we are advancing something that matters, right? Uh, and, you know, I just, I also care about that goal uh, and I wanted to help advance it how I could. Uh, and that also, you know, meant acknowledging that like, it's not always going to be, you know, sunshine and roses. Like sometimes it's, you know, not going to be great. Like we actually have to make sacrifices. Um, and if we want to, you know, keep advancing these values then we have to fight for it. Uh, we have to outcompete the rest of the world. And so the paradox of Moloch uh, that, uh, that I talk about sometimes is that like you sometimes you, you, we, we talk about slaying Moloch, but like the paradox is that in order to get the power to do so, we like sometimes have to worship at his altar, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Like if we didn't at all uh, strengthen ourselves or become competitive, uh, then, you know, we just auto lose, right? So uh there's like some middle ground between and this is why it's a paradox is like it doesn't fit you know very cleanly you're like i just want uh us to be the good guys forever you know uh but it's like um no it's like if, if you have this like value the thing you want to preserve protect advance you have to like compete for it fight for it you know do all the things that you'd normally do you just have to also preserve it uh because that's the core thing that you're trying to do so uh yeah I don't know if all that made I think, sense. Uh, we, we'll, we'll have to actually like explain this like Moloch meme. This is a, a meme that Bankless has been just like, it's the banner that we kind of live under. But again, we haven't really talked about it in 2021, 2022, nearly as much as we did uh, in earlier times. But maybe we could actually explain the Moloch meme by ex um, giving a history of its relationship with Ethereum, sure. uh, which... Uh, is an intimate part of like your own story with Ethereum. So maybe we can go back to where the Moloch meme was really just getting incepted into Ethereum culture for the first time. Cause you were really leading that charge. Could you take us back, back in time and start the story there? Yeah. Moloch means a couple things. So I read the blog post meditations on Moloch by Slate Star Codex, um, Scott Alexander, it's his rationalist blog post. And it describes the, you know, rationalist God of coordination failure 
put a word on an anxiety I've had my whole life, which is like, why can't we all get along? Why can't we have nice things? And it's like, you know, because people and, you know, in these competitive situations, they have something that they can sacrifice uh, that they value in order to get an edge. And the end result is everybody does it. And so, like, you end up in these sort of, you know, unfortunate equilibriums where, you know, as a country, we want to spend money on guns and bombs and planes. I'm sorry, we want to spend money on healthcare, education, and infrastructure, but we end up spending it on guns and bombs and planes uh, because we like can't coordinate with everyone else to disarm at the same time. Uh, and if even if we did coordinate with everyone else on the planet to disarm, then like whoever is the last person with all the guns, you know, takes everybody else over, and then the world reflects their values, which is like secretly amass a bunch of weapons. Uh, and so like the whole disarmament like wasn't very effective, right? Uh, and Moloch is used to, as like a shorthand to describe these like coordination failures where like if we could all just work together uh, and had some mechanism to do that, that would be great. And maybe we could reach a better equilibrium. But because we don't, we have to like compete and fight uh, and, and we're trapped in this like less good equilibrium. And the story of how it relates to Ethereum is that I also discovered Ethereum in like the same week, discovered Moloch. And then uh, try to bring these ideas because I realized that Ethereum was a platform for building coordination technology. So like if you're in one of these unfortunate equilibrium, you want to get to the better equilibrium, how do you do it? Well, you need to come up with some game to coordinate with everybody else uh, in order to, you know, advance this sort of better co coordination station. And so uh, the tools for doing things like that are what Ethereum is all about, in my opinion. And so... I was like, how do I get people to feel this thing that I feel right now? I'm going to call this DAO Moloch DAO. Hopefully, it'll get all these people to read this blog post. Uh, and we're like several years downstream from that. Uh, and now there's like comic books and like uh, more literature and memetics that are being developed around the Moloch meme. Uh, and it's turned into a sort of rallying cry for the Ethereum community uh, to coordinate around like what is, you know, our own mission? What is our goal? Uh, and helped you know crystallize it's like well what do we do here right uh we build coordination tools uh it's not about you know like my country my faith you know my whatever it's like about building things that allow us to like progress past the like coordination systems that we can even imagine today you know uh like countries are great but they have borders you know uh outside of the border like <laughs> you're not really our friend uh, so it like has a scalability limit to how far it can, you know, coordinate people. Uh, same with faith, you know, faith have heretics and non-believers, uh, and that, so they run into limits on, uh, coordination. And so the idea is like, what if, what, you know, the, the big idea for things like Ethereum is like, well, you know, how do we do better? Uh, like what if we took like country and faith and like other types of coordinate, you know, group, uh, nonprofit corporation like these are our starting points of coordination technology and so the way that we you know slay moloch is we improve on coordination technology itself uh and that's uh that's a powerful thing because i, I think a lot of a lot of, like we, you know we're used to being raised in this like us versus them mentality uh everybody is and so like trying to uh identify the traps like of the us versus them, you know, it's like us versus them is kind of a psyop. <laughs> uh, so we're like trying to figure out like what, what exactly is the, uh, like why is it us versus them in this specific way? Like how do we unlock, you know, more coordination value out of humanity? Um, and when we started making DAOs, like there were three DAOs, right? Uh, Moloch DAO was like, <laughs> it's like DAO number four. Uh, so we've had a great opportunity to like sound like complete, you know, uh, really out there, uh, like, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, heretics or, or, or uh, you know, nutcases or whatever. We're like, there's, yeah, there's going to be 10,000 DAOs, like when we're on DAO number three. Uh, this is like stuff that mm. we used to say with like Eva and Peter and James Young and all the people who were like early Moloch DAO because we could see the the coordination potential um, that we, we, you know, we we could see about to be unlocked. We're like, people are going to flip when they figure out DAOs, right? Um, 
<laughs> it's like and this was back like in um 2018 19 yeah yeah we're like building it in 2018 being like oh my god this is gonna be so much fun like people are gonna be so excited you know uh and there's like 10 DAOs by the end of the year yeah 2019 it was like me and peter and telegram groups just like starting another DAO every like couple weeks like marketing DAO, and there, there was like a a Ricci DAO. it was like a DAO for drinking you know uh events it's like the mm-hmm. kickback guys made it um there was there was all sorts of DAOs. Uh, we made the Yang DAO just to put, pay some kids in Colorado to like put up flyers and like pay the you know deep fake memes for Andrew Yang. So between 2019 and now, like 2022 at East Denver, I like let you know helped Andrew Yang get inside the event because uh, he was like stuck outside the event. I like went to you were talking to him because you were talking to him about DAOs mm-hmm. uh, and about his Lobby Three DAO. Uh, it was like a special event. And I, I was like, this is sweet. I want to go to Andrew Yang's event. I helped start Yang Dao. Uh, let's see <laughs> where he's gotten in three years. So we just roll up, you know. I'm like stuck outside East Denver, and there's a dude in front of me wearing a suit. I'm like, who the, who the fuck goes to East Denver wearing a suit? Uh, and the event organizers, like, wouldn't let him in. Uh, <laughs> and I look over, and it's like Andrew Yang. Like, apparently running for president isn't enough, you know, uh, right. to get into East Denver. <laughs> Turns out he'd like given somebody his badge or something. So I was able to, you know, give him my badge, get him in, uh, and gave a great talk with you guys on stage. So, um, yeah, it, it feels pretty cool to see all of that stuff happen. Uh, and then people like research Moloch, you know, they're like, oh, look, like this doubt. It's like cool to have, uh, you know, put that like medic brick in this like, wall, you know, immutable wall uh, and uh, see that you know, pay dividends in terms of uh, recruiting people to uh, be aligned with the original mission that we were trying to help people frame and understand. That was a long Just rant. I it, had a lot of caffeine. Thanks no, for that was great. listening to all that. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make it extremely, extremely explicit as to the connections being made here. But, but you said Ethereum is a platform to build coordination tools and then, and then you went through the history of Ethereum as it goes from three to 30,000 DAOs. I mean, yeah. You can extrapolate beyond 2020 to where we are today, where everyone, you can spin up a DAO to buy a constitution if you so choose. But just like, can, can you just connect the dots on all of these things about Ethereum as coordination tools, DAOs, and Moloch? Yeah. So like Moloch DAO, you know, was uh, one of the first DAOs. Uh, the, the first one blew up, right? It was called the DAO. Uh, and it's why we have Ethereum Classic and Hard Fork and da da da. And we had PTS DAO. And so we made Moloch DAO to be very simple uh, and to just like fund grants with ETH and do very little else. Um, but uh, between like, uh, the, 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 you know, Moloch DAO itself was a, a whole ordeal. Like we were onboarding people with Etherscan uh, at ETH Denver. You know, I was like manually typing in zeros. Uh, is, is very early um, in, in the whole process. Like now there's, you know, DAO tools for basically spinning up everything and uh, you know, there's a lot more flexibility. Um, and it took a lot of people just grinding for years. Uh, we we made Moloch DAO uh, like as, as a nonprofit just to do the grants for, with ETH, right? So, so it didn't have any of the other features. Uh, the original design for like my investment DAO Moloch Ventures is like closest to like what is being released just now with like Moloch version three. Um, so that we the version one was like just grants, uh, just you know deposit ETH. Couldn't do any other tokens. Didn't have any proposal types. Couldn't change the governance. Couldn't do anything. Right, and that was uh, to help address the security issues you know around launching these things because the last one had blown up and stuff, um, and so. Um, it was what we really needed to get over what you just called our PTS DAO of just like, okay, let's mi- eliminate all complexity and do one thing and one thing only, which is agree to coordinate as to where to send Ether. And so that's all right. other, all much surface area was just like stripped away because we as a community still, when you said the word DAO, people would flinch because we, you know, almost mm. blew up Ethereum yeah. and had to hard fork DAO. away. So that's we needed this like, yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> It sounds scary. <laughs> Why would you do that? Did you see what happened to the other guys who did that? They got blown up, dude. 
And we're like, okay, <laughs> relax. Like, we'll just do it the dumb way, the simple way. We won't do anything complicated. And then people, you know, other people would be like, we got this great feature idea for your DAO. And we'd be like, that's a great idea. We're not going to do it. <laughs> uh, talk to me in a year. <laughs> and so we had to like run a grant DAO for like just a year. And it turned out to be like the right thing to do. Um, to advance, you know, the, the coordination culture, to have more people who've done DAOs. And, like, I, I, I have this um, mental model of progress. Uh, maybe it's more relevant for, like, open source stuff. But, uh, you know, I, I see progress as a series of motivational equilibrium. Like, I don't actually have to solve everything myself. Uh, I just have to push the ball, you know, to push the uh, uh, state of affairs to, like, the next motivational equilibria where there's, like, more people more motivated to solve all the problems. Uh, and I feel like that's kind of what we accomplished um, with Moloch V1, just grants, you know, ran it for a year, got, you know, to hustle basically like 20 uh, people for 100 ETH early on, raised a couple mil, got EF, Consensus, Vitalik, Joe Lubin, put in a couple mil, made some grants, Tornado, you know, probably the most important, a um, bunch of other grants around ETH2, you know, helped give the first grant to like the thing that is now Protocol Guild uh, back in its inception. Um, you know, did, did all that, but like uh, also helped meme DAOs, you know, ma like help people recover from PTS DAO, uh, helped educate people about how to DAO. Like, what does it mean? There's proposals, there's, you know, a grace period, you can exit, like popularize the, the rage quit um, as a way of embedding minority protections into your DAO so that, you know, uh, participants can leave with their share of assets at any time. And like it took years for these concepts and, and, and like to proliferate and percolate in the, you know, eth ecosystem until now there's like lots of DAOs, you know, there's investment DAOs, there's like uh, protocol DAOs, there's nonprofits, there's social clubs. Um, and they, they run using, you know, different types of systems. Some are multi-sigs. I'm like a DAO boomer at this point. So I'm like, all right, you know, that's a multi-sig, get off my lawn. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, like people started coordinating, right? Like all of these are examples of coordination. Um, with Moloch DAO, we raised money from like, I don't know, 25, 30 some people in like 10, 12 something different countries with no paperwork. Uh, nobody signed anything. Uh, it would have been a lot harder to do the same type of thing in like your, you know, meat space. Uh, you know, your I, I I talk about these things as like your jurisdictional stack, right? So like, uh, in order to do the thing which Malik Dow did, which is like allow you to pool money with a group of people, but also like vote on proposals, and uh, if you you know at any time don't want to spend your money anymore, pull your money out without asking anyone is like impossible to do in meat space because you have to like set up a bank account, hire lawyers, come up with bylaws, and then you have like several people, you know, to do every process. You're like, oh, we would like to collect signatures on a vote on this thing. Oh, okay. You have to like go through some software, Carta, you know, it, like, uh, you know, s s some like management thing um, to like collect signatures and authenticate people. Uh, and you have to do that every time you want to, you know, spend money on anything. Uh, and then, like, if somebody wants to leave, they have to, like, ask for permission. And then, like, they have to go through their lawyer to go through the banker and, like, send a wire. And, like, any of those steps could, like, fail for whatever reason or get held up or frozen or, you know, censored. Uh, and, like, the, uh, you know, the reason that people trusted the Moloch Dow smart contracts was because they knew that they could push a button and the, the smart contract would release their money. They didn't have to talk to anybody. There's no, like, jurisdictional stack of things that can fail. Uh, and that unlocks a lot of value. Um, the overhead that isn't there uh, now makes it so that it's viable to create a group like this to solve a problem that would otherwise have been, you know, not worth making a group like this to solve. Uh, and so, like, when I'm talking about unlocking coordination potential, like, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. It's like, specifically, the coordination overhead is a number and it gets smaller, right? Uh, across all of the participants, uh, needing to verify that other people have done stuff, that the treasury is accurate. Like these are all, you know, trust things that allow us to trust each other more quickly and allow groups to scale trust more quickly and, and execute their goals more easily. So, uh, yeah, this is like stuff, it, nothing has changed, right? Uh, between <laughs> 2018, 2019 and now, uh, like, like, like some more code has been written uh, to make these things easier. But really what's happening is stories. Like I was, I remember interviewing 
uh, a CoinDesk reporter in twenty uh, last year at at MCon. I just got back from MCon uh, in Denver. So that's the Meta Cartel Conference. So they did MCon two this year. Last year they did MCon one. And I talked to this journalist, and they asked me like what the limiting factor was of for like growth and you know more people thinking it's a good idea. And I I, I said that like the code is mostly there. Uh, the limiting factor is stories. People need to see the narratives develop. People need to see the story of somebody doing a DAO, being successful, you know, raising money for some cause, and then being able to imagine themselves as part of that story uh, in their own way. And until that happens, you can't recruit people because they don't have any examples of how to work with it, you know, the framework. They're like, okay, you have a DAO, like, what do I do? Right. And so it's really important, I think, to push narratives forward. Uh, and so with, with Malik Dow, you know, the, the story was an ETH dev, <laughs> didn't feel like going through the EF for grants, <laughs> uh, made his own DAO <laughs> for grants and like uh, started funding things to advance the ecosystem and like eventually got other people, you know, including the EF to buy in and like operated his nonprofit, you know, using this technology with a community of people that were into it and like protected their own, you know, minority rights. Uh, you can too, you know, like, um, it was basically a non-starter to like consider using things like DAOs for, uh, you know, any, like nonprofits and stuff until we had an example of us doing that in a successful way. So it's, a lot of times it's, you know, you just got to go first. Uh, <laughs> one of the elements of why this works so well, you touched on it and I, I want to double down on it is this like free ability to exit as an individual. Uh, and it's truly something that only is, is possible because of private keys, uh, because of, you know, really the invention of being able to custody your own funds and have people ask you for permission rather than you being the person to ask for permission. Can you just, okay, let's double down on that. Why, why is that such a fundamental part about like why all of this coordination stuff works in the first place? Yeah, this is a great, great question. Uh, Custodying funds is great uh, because it means you don't have to ask people for permission to use your money. Um, just very high level, like custodying funds is one of the core things that blockchains, specifically cryptocurrencies, are about, right? Like even if DeFi and stuff doesn't, you know, where it's like you don't want to have to like call your bank to send a wire and they're like, no. <laughs> right? <laughs> just basically like that. You never want that outcome. Uh, and like the Bitcoin network, you know, so long as it remains censorship resistant, will never say no to you. Uh, Ethereum network will never say no to you. Um, and then we can like piggyback off of this like custody property to do other cool and useful things, right? So like <clears throat> one of the, 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 you know, differences between something like Moloch DAO and something like a nonprofit with a bank account is that you have custody of your funds. Uh, th th this is also different if like you use the multi-sig, right? Um, you know, the, the operators, the signers of the multi-sig are custody, you know, custodians of the funds, right? But Moloch DAO had this very specific, you know, unique uh, new property called the rage quit, uh, and that allowed you to maintain custody and sovereignty of your funds even while you pooled it with other people. Uh, and so that's that's an important thing because it turns your like donation to this nonprofit into more like a pledge, uh, a revocable pledge. And so you can choose to exit. You know, if a proposal isn't going the way you wanted, you voted no. The rest of the you know DAO is like, well, we really just do want to spend money on this, and like if you don't like it, so be it. You can be like, well. Okay, fine. You know, I accept that you guys are still going to fund this. I disagree. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm taking my money. I don't want it to go for this cause and I'm rage quitting. I'm exiting with my pro rata share of the remaining funds. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm out, right? And, and I had custody of my money. I didn't need to ask them for permission to do that. But it does also change this game theory. Uh, it, if you've heard about, you know, the voice and exit, uh, like custodial systems have no exit, <laughs> right? Uh, the, you can have a voice, uh, you can, you know, complain or ask for help or permission. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, unless you can exit, uh, you're sort of trapped. Uh, and then it's, you, you can be coerced 
uh, you can uh, be forced to do things with your money that you do not consent to. Um, and so uh, being able to have custody over your money, even while it's in a DAO, even while you pooled it with other people, even while we can submit proposals and decide how to spend it together, but also retaining that ability to you know, exit whenever you want, super important because it makes it a lot easier to join in the first place. Uh, I would, I'm would basically willing to join any Moloch DAO because if it has a rage quit, I'm like, well, you know, what's the worst that could happen? Uh, they submit a proposal, I don't like it, and I leave. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I, so I, the, the cost of joining any DAO is as close to zero as, it's basically a gas fee. And so, in theory, it, there's it some social the costs, of, you know, of like, oh, I joined, now I have to sure. leave, I have to talk to people. But exactly, it opens up the landscape. Right. And so, like the the joining like a nonprofit has overhead, right? So, how many nonprofits can one person really manage their their relationship with in their lives? Probably a single digit number. Probably even on the average person, no more than like two. Um, but like in with DAOs, like your participation in DAOs is really as many discords as you feel compelled to like pay attention to. Basically, yeah. And how does this yeah. change the relationship of like the broader org? with its individual members because now like this is all about putting power into the hands of the individual right like the individuals always have well maybe they don't have the most power but you don't have organizations don't have power over the individual if there is that That's rage right. quit mechanism so how does that change like the nature of the organization when that is the new equilibrium it makes it uh much more likely that the decisions of the organization will reflect the values of the individual members. Um, you, you sort of get this like all proposals are consensual implicitly because everybody has the opportunity to leave uh, if they disagree with any proposal. So the game theory of it works out that like the organization is not incentivized to pass any proposals that they think will make a lot of the people leave. Uh, because even if I can make this proposal pass, like if you guys all leave, <laughs> then, you know, I'm stuck paying for it and I might end up being like paying more for it. Right. So to the extent that I want to share the costs of things with you, it's to my, uh, it would behoove me to make sure that like we're spending the money on things that like generally benefit everybody. Um, and if there's any imbalance, uh, even perceived imbalance, uh, then the people have the opportunity, you know, to rage quit and make that known. Uh, and that disincentive, you know, uh, provides a, a feedback mechanism for the group. Um, maybe the group just doubles down because now there's less, uh, you know, outside like, like conflict, um, within the group, but also that's a good outcome for the group for the remaining members. It's like, we can actually build alignment over time by shedding some of the members who might be less aligned as we go. And so um, I think I think it it's actually a good system for both, you know, the individual goals and the uh, goals for of the group. ZK Sync is an Ethereum layer two network that is pushing the frontier of high performance blockchains that don't compromise on security or decentralization. ZK Sync has combined the power of zero knowledge rollups in the Ethereum virtual machine, enabling developers to build the greatest Web3 projects possible, ones we haven't even seen yet. Crypto needs its killer applications to onboard the world, but crypto killer apps need ZK Sync as a platform to build on first. It's generally accepted that zero knowledge rollups are the conclusion of crypto blockchain scaling technology, and ZK Sync is leading the charge into the final frontier of crypto economics. So if you're a developer who wants to build your app on a future-proof foundation, which gives your users the best UX possible, check out ZK Sync's website at zksync.io. And yes, there's also going to be a token, so give them a follow on Twitter too, at zksync. Rocket Pool is your decentralized Ethereum staking protocol. You can stake your ETH in Rocket Pool and get our ETH in return, allowing you to stake your ETH and use it in DeFi at the same time. You can get 4% on your ETH by staking it with Rocket Pool, but you can get even more by running a node. Rocket Pool is the only staking provider that allows anyone to permissionlessly join their network of validating Ethereum nodes. Setting up your Rocket Pool node is easier than running a node solo, and you only need 16 ETH to get started. You get an extra 15% staking commission on the pooled ETH that uses your 
your node to stake. You also get RPL token rewards on top. So if you're bullish ETH staking, you can boost your yield by adding your node to the decentralized Rocket Pool network, which currently has over 1,000 independent node operators. It's yield farming, but with Ethereum nodes. You can get started at rocketpool.net, and you can also join the Rocket Pool community in their Discord. You can find me hanging out there sometimes in the chat, so I'll see you there. Lens Protocol is an open source tech stack for building decentralized social media applications. It is the new era for social media. We all have toxic relationships with our Web2 apps. We want to break up with them, but we can't. These applications own our digital lives and all the relationships that we've made. We need to break through to a new paradigm of social networking applications that we control rather than them controlling us. Lens isn't a social media app, it's a protocol to let a thousand Web3 social apps bloom. Lens is a permissionless and transparent social graph that is owned by the user. In crypto, we say not your keys, not your crypto, and on Lens, we say not your keys, not your profile. With Lens, your followers go with you to whatever social media application you want to use. And instead of being trapped by an algorithm chosen by that app, Lens lets you you choose the way you want to experience your social media. Lens is the last social media handle that you'll ever need to create. So in order to get started, there is a secret code word in the show notes. Enter that code word in the Google Form links and you'll be well on your way to entering the world of Web3 Social. And we, we can like do a quick compare and contrast of like other social systems, right? Where like say, say there's a DAO, uh, maybe, maybe let's like take um, uh, the Constitution DAO just because that's kind of the big one that everyone knows about. That's the most modern. And say like the Constitution DAO leadership voted to pay themselves half the money in the treasury and that's like eight of them. Uh, and say right. this vote actually goes through. Well, then there's the rage quit mechanism that all these people can rage quit before they they their half their money gets paid to the leadership, right? Which makes that's this exactly vote right. not even like feasible in the first place to ever do. But like we can compare yeah. this with like, I don't know, maybe a nation state where the leadership of a nation state, since they're the ones that control the military, they can just say, hey, all all gold is now illegal. You must pay it to us. And we now own all the gold. It's 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 harder for these individuals to exit because like, you know, it's, it's one thing to exit from a DAO by processing a transaction on Ethereum to get your money back. But it's another thing to like process the exit from a nation state where you have your home and your family and your life uh, and your culture. And so like this thing is... And, and the, they, they just took your gold. And they, Yeah, right. <laughs> and so like, I mean, the, 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 we're you know, doing a, an apples to oranges comparison here, but like this is the difference between what is a systems that are free to exit and systems that have high cost to exit. It's like high cost to exit systems allow for opportunity to like bully you around. That's right. Yeah, the first question, you know, people ask is like uh, when you try to get them into this type of thing is like, how do I leave? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the concern is like, I don't want to be bullied by the other members. Like, I don't want my funds to go to stuff that I don't want. Uh, so I either have to trust the other members or, you know, trust that I can leave, trust the mechanism. And like when you can trust the mechanism, you know, uh, it's a lot easier to spin these things up and start making grants and see it, you know, see how they go without as much overhead, without as much risk, uh, without as much opportunity for coercion. Mm -hmm. There's a, a line that I go back and forth with, uh, Kevin Owaki, and I believe also you, is that like, you don't actually kill Moloch. You don't actually like magically solve all coordination failure, but you can make that make Moloch retreat. Right. Can, can you help us draw this connection between like, all right, well, we didn't exactly, you know, by, you know, the state of DAOs in 2022, it's not like we've really solved coordination failure. We kind of just made a bunch of Ponzi's. Now we're in the bear market. <laughs> but uh, oops. But but also like uh, we have created a new system where Moloch retreats. Right. Can, can you just explain like going where, where we have like this new coordination platform, which is Ethereum. And now we have this new coordination primitive, which is DAOs. How is Moloch less deadly as a result of this? Um, I think, I think the cool thing, maybe this is like a frustrating thing, but, uh, I, I started saying this more recently is that like, I think it captures this concept fairly well. Uh, slaying Moloch is an infinite game. Hmm. Uh, and like what that means to me is that like, you know, uh, looming behind the rotting corpse of the most recently slain Moloch is like a shadowier, deadlier Moloch, you know, waiting to strike. <laughs> right. Moloch uh, level two. Moloch level yeah, three. And, and so it's like this endless series of boss fights, you know, uh, and like we can just keep going. 
uh, and like see what happens. And it's like still worth playing this game because it still seems worth, you know, advancing coordination because like that's what it, I don't, I think that's like the, what it means to be human. Uh, right. Like, what the hell else are we going <laughs> to do? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, the opposite of that is just like winning some, you know, uh, intermittent zero sum game. <laughs> right. um, so, so yeah, I mean, we did all this DAO stuff. Uh, now we have to sort of like the way I see it now is like we have we have DAO veterans now, right? So like last year it was like freshman year activity fair, activity expo. You know, you show up to college. There's booths everywhere. You want to be in every club. You sign up for ten. You you know you make it to the end of the semester, and like you're lucky if you're still showing up to like three or four, you know, maybe, maybe less. Um, and then this year is like sophomore year, right? Everybody's like, okay, we know how last year went. Uh, we will sign up for a couple clubs and we will, you know, stick with them and we will like, you know, make sure it's useful and not like too much to handle and blah, blah, blah. And by junior year, you're like leading clubs, you know, you're, you're, you have like a leadership position. And I see everybody going through the same sort of progression that we did which is like, we start out, we have no idea what we're doing. Uh, we hope we're doing useful stuff. Uh, <laughs> you know? uh, and then like after a while, we like figure it out. It's like, oh, like, you know, flat organizations are kind of hard or like, oh, like this isn't just like a corporation on a blockchain. Like, you know, pe people who come from both sort of sides are having, you know, sort of trouble and like are uh, learning to like, build structures within the context of DAOs and like figure out what processes work, how to do compensation, right? And so there's like cultural knowledge being built up in, you know, a thousand different groups at the same time uh, about how to do all of this stuff. And that is what is going to anchor the next generation of DAO contributors and people, right? So like in the same way that everybody who more or less joined Moloch DAO, like went on to start some kind of DAO, right? Peter started a bunch of DAOs, Cooper started a bunch of DAOs, Ryan, you know, started Bankless. Uh, <laughs> he was in <laughs> Moloch DAO, you know. Um, so a lot of the people who have now come into DAOs as contributors, uh, as tourists, uh, get to learn and, and, and figure out what's going on that, oh, you know, it's not all just like, th these DAO guys haven't figured everything out. Right, like we, we haven't just solved coordination, uh, but we we have like discovered you know useful tools at coordinating better, and like you know you can look at the amount of money raised or the you know number of these groups that have formed and like the excitement around them all as indicators that like we're making progress, uh, we're doing something right, and like the things that will you know, interests me more is like next generation, right? So like, uh, right now we have like plutocracy, you know, plutocracy, like for basically everything, like token vote. Um, Vitalik writes about this, you know, in collusion resistance that we need more, you know, identifiable systems so that we can vote with people, uh, have some amount of democracy in addition to having all of the, you know, plutocracy that we have, um, like, Nobody has really done that well. Like Optimism is trying. They have their like two-tiered, you know, governance system. That's pretty cool to see. Uh, I think we'll see more structures form. Uh, some might even be like more centralized and like have explicit like CEO type or like hegemon type. Uh, and and I think that like if you zoom out, like all of the things that we're building DAOs for right now are like toys and prototypes. Uh, like. The cool things is like when, you know, when is the United Nation on chain, hmm. right? Uh, <laughs> it's like, that's like our sort of like terminal, you know, like when are, when are like international agreements on chain? Like I started reading for fun uh, about the ancient DAOs, uh, like the Greek city-state agreements uh, that, that they made, the Peloponnesian League and the like Delian League. And these are the Athenian and Spartan-led DAOs uh, <laughs> that they used to coordinate ancient Greece. And they have like interesting policies. Like Spart Sparta ran theirs differently than how Athens ran theirs. Like Sparta is like, we're the hedgemen. We're going to have a deal with every city state. And like you sign a deal with us. We might not even like really tell anybody else the terms, but like 
uh, you agree to have the same enemies and allies that we do is the sort of foundation of all, all of these. Um, and then the Athenian version, uh, there's a little bit more uh, dem democratic. They have like a council, you know, within Athens that they like vote on proposals for. And then like if those proposals pass, they like go to like the, the greater council with all the other city states. Uh, and then, you know, they try to pass them there and like Athens would often abstain. And like there's interesting things about how, how they manage them. Um, and I, I think that's like where this is going, uh, right? Like we don't. <laughs> uh, we're, like maybe we aren't paying attention to it as much um, but like like if it's not going there like I'll be really surprised uh, because the stuff is so useful that it will naturally find a home in like the most high stakes uh, you know environments eventually once once we've built these narratives and once we've done this infrastructure work and all that and really what you're talking about is like Ethereum as like this like neutral middle ground between nation states or between like the largest coordinating entities in the world. Is, is that, is that the image that should be in listeners heads? Yeah. Uh, global settlement layer coordination platform for humanity, you know, these kinds of things. Like when we say that, you know, we kind of mean, yeah, it'll like also settle your crypto punks, you know, and, and like <laughs> that stuff. But like, <laughs> like the goal you know, if it, like, why, why do we care about censorship resistant, right? It's like, why do we care about neutrality? Like, the reason we care about these things is because we're trying to build a system that doesn't give specific advantages to one nation state or, you know, religious group or whatever, right? Um, and it, 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 you know, just sort of runs on math and does math things and, like, <laughs> uh, can operate, you know, a virtual machine and settle contracts, but, like, doesn't care too much about contents of those contracts and so forth, right? Um, and that's sort of what you need to allow for, like, I, I don't know if I talked about this with you, but like, maybe we, like, when I watch Vikings and like the ancient game theory between kings is like, they just have these hostage trades with their children, right? It's like, you know, uh, ancient, like, coordination in that era was like, I will make you, you know, the way to make our behavior more mutually predictable to each other is to deposit our children into a two of two multisig, uh, such that we both need to work together to unlock the children. And if we fail, they die. It's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, everyone just went along with that because that was like the best system that had ever existed to that point. It's like savage, right? But it worked. And it's like, and you're just talking you know, about you, like, all right, like you've got a daughter, I've got a son. We're going to put them in the same room. They're going to have babies and we're going to stop hating each other. Is that what, that, that's what you're talking right. about? I'm talking about like, you know, I give you my son to raise and like you give me uh -huh. your daughter to raise. But like uh -oh. a, a lot of times they did also <laughs> do uh, right. like, like marriage contracts was like right. down the road and it was like, we'll raise your daughter for a time. We'll, you'll raise, you know, a, and then, or they'll both be in our place for three years and your place for three, you know, uh, and then it uh, doesn't serve Just as much for the two of you each other. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> and like, if you could coordinate better, like you might survive better because like you would out coordinate the other guys who like couldn't put their sons in a multi-sig uh, and therefore had a smaller army. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> it like sounds dumb to say like that, but like. That's that's like that's like how things worked, right? Mm -hmm. And that was like that people were like, yeah, right, like the you know whatever, like did, and like if you didn't put your kids in a multi sig, you're like, bro, this alliance is suspect. Like <laughs> our our like, kids are not in multi sig together. There's not there's nothing yeah. aligned here. <laughs> yeah, basically, and so like the question for things like Ethereum is like, can we? do this without being savages like can we put eth into a two of two multi sig uh but can we make eth neutral enough you know that like people trust it uh enough to work as this like you know bearer bond like neutrally enforced by like the system based on some you know contract so like in the future, maybe peace treaties uh, or alliances or non-aggression pacts uh, would be seen as suspect if they don't have an on-chain bond in a neutral currency.
Right, right, right. And so, like, my, my head has gone to, like, sweet, we are definitely beyond the barbaric era of, like, using children as collateral. So, like, we, we've, we're now in democracies. But actually, we have, like, nuclear <laughs> missiles pointed at every single corner of the globe. And, like, people forget about that when they just are going about their, like, day-to-day -day basis. But, like, yeah. you know, using children as collateral, definitely barbaric. But if that's barbaric and we're using that as, like, a facetious example of, like, how to force coordination upon warring tribes, what the hell is this, like, push-button nuclear Armageddon that we have? Like, how is that not just bar barbarism to the nth degree? And that's because, like, this physical nation-state world is based on, like, physical rules of who's more powerful than... The neighbors, and you already gave the example of just like you know we we can't really just globally uh, demilitarize because that just leaves the most brutal military as the one that's left standing. But that's because it's that's the physical world, right? Like in Ethereum and Bitcoin, there are no there is no stick. There are only only carrots to incentivize coordination, uh, because you know Bitcoin incentivizes coordination by paying you bitcoins to mine it, right? Ethereum incentivizes uh, security by like locking up your ether, and then it will it will punish you if you like try and attack the blockchain. And then DAOs, as as we've we said, DAOs are like. So long as there's a rage quit mechanism built into them, and that's kind of like table stakes for DAOs, uh, that like there's no stick in the system. There's only opt-in incentives. And so like, I don't know how we get all global like tribes to coordinate with Ethereum, but whatever it is, it has to be by definition like an opt-in carrot-based system that doesn't, because they don't have sticks. So Ethereum doesn't give you a stick because it's stuck inside of the internet. Yeah, at the protocol level, Ethereum doesn't have sticks. Uh, it mm -hmm. only gives out carrots. You can think of like a stick as like slashing, but like that's a, you know, a but you can opt out of that. You don't have stick. to stake. Right. Yeah. You <laughs> yeah, uh, you yeah. opt into the slashing. You don't have to opt out of the slashing. If if there was like a war treasury uh, as part of the protocol fund, you know, mm. uh, then maybe Ethereum could have a stick. Uh, the the United States started without a stick too. Uh, in some sense, uh, because it, mm. it started not collecting taxes, um, like at the federal level, it didn't have a right. federal tax. It only added that later on. Um, I don't think it's likely that Ethereum adds protocol, you know, level funding. Uh, I think it's even less likely that if we have it, it goes towards uh, funding sticks. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, that's what you would need to do. So yeah, it doesn't seem likely. Um, right. The the uh, U.S. dollar is a protocol with a stick, a uh, really big stick. You know, it doesn't even really speak softly anymore. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, we we like to um, like blow up like the the whole like dollar uh, demand. You know, propping it up petrodollar thing is kind of weird. Um, I went on a bunch of rants about this after the tornado stuff because I was angry uh, and people were like talking about how tornado is like the bad guys and how like, you know, crimes are bad. And it's like, I agree that crimes are bad. Uh, there's just like nuance there. Uh, <laughs> um, because like a lot of things that were crimes like aren't crimes anymore or we like look back at them and we're like really ashamed of them being crimes. And, you know, we like don't do the thing where we like reward the entrepreneurs uh, for their like taking on the risk of like breaking those crimes uh, or laws or whatever and in order to like normalize and make progress for the rest of it like I order marijuana in a store I pay taxes it's FDA approved to make sure it's like very high concentration and there's like people still in jail for you know having small amounts of it right. like years ago uh, a lot of times in the dollar bubble, we're like, we're the good guys right. uh, because right. like we, you know, we're America, but like we also do questionable things to uh, enforce dollar demand, like blow up Iraq to enforce the petrodollar, you know, steal everybody's gold, stop, you know, doing dollar redemptions. And then I'm, I'm getting the chronology a little bit out of order here, but sure. it's just a, uh, it's a long list. So, yeah, it's a long list. A and it's. It's not just the U.S. It's like every country sort of does this thing. Uh, so this is this is maybe a segue into Rye. Uh, mm. 
like my other project, Rise, a fork of MakerDAO, you know, trying to um, try to see if we can make stable coins without explicit pegs to the dollar. Uh, and so it is pegged to like a dollar denominated number, but it, it's allowed to float. Uh, and Rye has been great so far because of what it's been able to teach us, uh, where like, you know, what we're doing on Ethereum, like we, we want to like, <clears throat> we, we want to believe that like the systems that we're building are like improvements over the status quo, right? Um, Bitcoin gets to say that like, because of 21 million, you know, they're transparent and, you know, it's not uh, inflationary, uh, you know, and, and the inflation doesn't like benefit a specific cartel, right? Ethereum gets to make similar statements, not quite as hard on the currency uh, side, but like, you know, we, we take some liberties because we, we uh, have the utility of the uh, smart contract platform. And so we optimize for making that as useful as possible. Um, but we haven't like, you know, like solved money. Uh, and money is like the scam that like every country runs on its citizens. Uh, and we have like the privilege in the United States of like not having it be as bad as most countries. Uh, where the inflation is like pretty bad uh, and like often, you know, increases unexpectedly. Uh, and like we don't you can't like ask central bankers how to operate a central bank like right now uh, because the way that they do it is so like bastardized from like how it in theory should be done uh, because they just have to like manage their like most of them didn't come up with the scheme. They're, they're just like inherited some Ponzi that they're trying to keep alive for as long as possible. Uh, and that's like what they're judged, you know, on their, their job. Uh, and, and so like with Ethereum, uh, with, with things like die, the original idea that's was such that an was awesomely like, like reductive way of explaining what the fed does is just like prop up the Ponzi <laughs> and good, good feds promote the longevity of the Ponzi. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to that point, but, okay. uh, yeah, we, we haven't like, we haven't like gotten past the dollar, right? Like we have our USDC, we're like, yeah, we're mm -hmm. DeFi, you know? We had our DAI, it was backed by ETH at first. We're like, yeah, you know, we, we've decentralized finance, but like it's still mostly dollars, right? And so we, we wanna look at it and we wanna be like, well, how do we get away from dollars? And there's a couple ways, right? There's one which is like, well, back it with something else, right? You can, you can have a dollar denominated instrument, but that doesn't come with, you know, the like, USDC block lists, for example, if like you use DAI or something, you know, um, or, or even like FRAX. Um, but but uh, with, with DAI, it was like, originally it was like, well, let's back it by Ether and then, you know, the collateral can't be frozen. But then they back it with USDC and then you're like, okay, well, shit, right. uh, now what? Uh, and so that's why with Rai, it's backed only with ETH, um, but it's still like dollar denominated, you know? So it's still somewhat subject to the esoteric policies of the, you know, Federal Reserve. It just like, can float, you know, around it. Uh, I mean, you and, like, mean it's dollar its denominated in the sense that, like, if I ask you the price of rye, yeah, it's it will, a dollar, and it, like the interest rate oh, oh, is oh, expressed die, in me. dollar yeah. terms. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, th and then, uh, like, you know, it started at three point one four. It's like floated down. I think it's like two point eight five now, um, mm -hmm. and so it it has a negative interest rate uh, fairly consistently. Uh, since the crash to incentivize people to deposit ETH to help bribe, you know, holders uh, or uh, borrowers get out if they need to. That's what the elevated ripe signal on the market um, tells the system to do automatically. We don't have to have meetings about this. We just let the controller run, sets the rates automatically. So um, this kind of thing is nice uh, because what Rai is, is, it's like sort of a central bank in a box, you know, and like you can like operate your little thing on the blockchain, your toy first principles developed you know, central bank thing. And then you can use it and then look at theirs and be like, how the fuck did you get there? Uh, like what, what series of, you know, what, like what monstrosity have you wrought? Uh, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like you guys, like if you try to explain, you know, how you get to the fed and like maker doubt, you know, like starting from a, something like maker doubt, you're like, okay, so first you have to rug pull the collateral. Right. Uh, you, you really, you know, Nixon wants to drop bombs on Vietnam. Uh, you told everybody that the dollars were pegged to gold, including all the foreign countries that you promised that you would redeem. Uh, so we'd lie to everybody. Uh, we really want to bomb Vietnam. So we print a bunch of dollars, bomb Vietnam. But now there's more dollars, same amount of gold, you know, 
uh, France comes calling with their battleship. I, maybe it was someone else, but uh, and they're France. like, hello, Fort, yeah, Fort Knox, yeah. like, give us the gold. And then Nixon's like, public announcement, uh, in order to defend the integrity of the U.S. dollar, we are ending redemptions. Right. He he uh, did that because he heard that Charles de Gaulle the third or somebody sent the battleship to go get the gold. Right. And so the battleship yes. was on the way to go get the gold. Yes. And Nixon was like, I'm closing the window. So you guys yeah. didn't make it in time. Sorry. Yeah. Because we're close. Right. We're close for business. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then basically everybody scrambled. People started selling their dollars. And then uh, the U.S. came up with the petrodollar scheme. Uh, and so this was like the let's like pump the Ponzi on the demand side. You know, let's find our like pool two. Uh, <laughs> and and so their pool two was in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and they made deals with the Saudis and, you know, the other oil producing nations to uh, sell them, s sell oil exclusively for dollars. And they give, you know, discounts uh, to, to allow the Saudis to reinvest in bonds and stocks and whatever, and they get, you know, military bases and F-15s, you know, and so forth. Um, and so we did this uh, to prop up the dollar uh, in the face of, you know, the, and so th then it's like, the, the reason I bring all of this up is because like, you need all of this context in order to have a moral conversation uh, about the dollar. Uh, because without all that, it's just like dollar good, uh, you know, uh, alternatives to dollar bad, mm -hmm. you know, and it's just like, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> like, let's go down the list and like, you, you know, you like the, the reason I, I like to bring this up with Americans is because there's there's sort of like two places that you get to, you know, when you when you start thinking this through, you're like, OK, either we're like full real politic, like, fuck, yeah, America, you know, World War One, World War Two, back to back champs. Right. Like um, right. <laughs> dollar Ponzi forever. Right. Like it's the best Ponzi ever. Like we're winning. Right. Like that's the mentality, uh, you know, imp mm -hmm. like imperialism. We're the best at it. Right. Uh, <clears throat> versus the other, which is like uh, acknowledging the dollar as like a cost in your like moral balance sheet uh, because you have to like occasionally go blow up a rock because Saddam is selling, you know, oil for euros. And we don't like that. And we want to set an example. And, you know, uh, like maybe. Like the, the U.S. empire is like a good thing, you know, good thing, like generally for the world, like in, in terms of our ability to combat China, our ability to thwart Russia. Like if the U.S. wasn't as powerful, Ukraine would have a much harder time, possibly also be Russia right now. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like it's a good thing that the U.S. has the strength to fight off these like, you know, uh, despotic invaders and authoritarian communists and you know th these types of things um and and but like then it, like at least you've put the like dollar ponzi thing into like a moral cost you know you're like ah the, the cost of doing this is like we have to do this stuff in order to you know be able to and then and like you know at least that's like a more reasonable conversation you can have out of that because then you can be like well what happens when the u.s stops being like a good policeman internationally or something right like maybe th this isn't uh you know able to be propped up um uh like you know it's not morally uh worth it uh or something um but you're but you <clears throat> what you're saying is that at least you are having to consider the worth of it as in at least yes. we are not just dumbly saying dollar good we are actually doing like a cost benefit analysis on this thing yeah and like there's other things you know around this too where it's like the dollar being strong in the sense that like post 1970s petrodollar dollar as the world reserve currency uh, hollowed out a lot of American manufacturing and mm -hmm. like middle class jobs and ship them over uh, overseas because, uh, you know, that's uh, like the, the currency valuations were more favorable for that. And so like the U.S. became a net exporter of dollars. And so the entire financier class made a killing uh, right. and everybody else. The manufacturing class took took the L, and I actually remember explicitly asking Lynn Alden if the Triffin dilemma, what we're talking about here, the the mm -hmm. fact that the dollar right. is the global reserve currency, was that the main 
main source, main reason why Donald Trump got elected. And she was like, yes, I do believe that that's why that happened. Because Donald yeah. Trump ran on that platform of manufacturing in Pennsylvania, like all the all these high manufacturing uh, states that flipped red and elected Donald Trump. They lost all their manufacturing jobs because we just started exporting dollars for free because we were printing them. And then, you know, the it's like that that domino meme, you know, down the line because of because we have to export our dollars because of the petrodollar, like we lose all of our internal manufacturing jobs and then we elect Donald Trump because we're aggrieved. Yes. 100%. Uh, yeah. Uh, th th these are like the things that are like downstream of the like, you know, currency like mm -hmm. scams and, and you know, the, the, the discontents of the <laughs> the currency ma manipulation. And like the, the, the decision that the U.S. made as an empire was like we're mm -hmm. going to switch to being like a financial thing. You know, we're going right. to just export dollars and play with money. Um and then, and then it becomes really important to prop up demand for the dollar, right? Right. Uh, and like the only real collateral we have because there's so much dollars is dollar denominated debt, mm -hmm. which is real bad. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, right. There, there's a story that I like to tell. Uh, and this is about Thomas Jefferson and slavery. Um, and like the reason I tell this story. Uh, is because like when we think about this, we like we think about this as like a problem that like you know it's almost intractable, right? Uh, like like you couldn't go protest this, right? Um, like <laughs> uh, like um, okay. Well, I, a lot of times when I talk to people, they they seem to think that like working inside the system is like the best option for making change, right? And that like almost every problem you can like you know, solve eventually by working inside the system. And I like to bring up like the American South and slavery and civil war. Um, Thomas Jefferson, uh, the, the guy who, uh, you know, wrote like uh, all men are created equal. He also came up with this like really fascinating financial instrument, uh, slave collateralized debt. He basically made oh, yeah. maker DAO for your slaves. Uh, so he rolled up to a bank and was like, yo, I've got all these slaves. I need money can I use the slaves as collateral and get cash? And the bank was like, huh, interesting idea. We're down. And like fast forward 50, 60 years, the entire South was like using huge amounts of loans, uh, to, like backed by slave uh, collateral. And so like, uh, like th this was basically a slave Ponzi that went out of control. Like they were yield farming, like literally, you know, right. Yield farm, right? And that you'd like leverage up, right? Oh, I got right. some money. Let me buy more slaves. Let me get more debt, you know? Um, Use and the so yield of the slaves to to get more money, to get more slaves, to put more slaves as collateral and re, like, yeah. cycle it the, to back up. The the slave population of uh, West Virginia, I think, was like 60%. And uh, or maybe it was like South Carolina was 60%. And like Virginia was like 40%. So the, the slave populations had grown a lot. Um, and like... Every founding father, like the, the banks were trading these uh, contracts, uh, like fast forward 50, 60 years as if they're like mortgage backed securities today. Like they oh bundled, you know, like, you know, and so it's basically this like bank enforced Ponzi at that point, uh, right? right? Because it's not like the banks are going to let you off the hook, right? The banks aren't just going to allow you to jubilee, right? Uh, so... This is one of those cases where it's like, even if the political will existed, even if the moral will existed within that context, within the South, it didn't matter because the economic reality was that you couldn't get everybody to pay back their debt at the same time uh, in order to like release their slaves. Uh, and, and not only that, they were like terrified of their slaves, like because of how, you know, poorly they'd been treating them. They're, like this is why they made the Klan and stuff after is to continue terrorizing them, uh, you know, as like a first strike. Um, but uh, every founding father died uh, knowing that this war, the Civil War, was inevitable uh, because there is no way within the system uh, to get out of that slave debt Ponzi, right? Uh, if you're a person in the South <laughs> and you're like, hey, guys, I think this is a bad idea. We should stop doing this. Mm -hmm. You don't get very far. Uh, everybody sort of has to be opposed to you 
uh, even if they don't like, even if they agree with you, uh, like, you know, <clears throat> they, they, they can't, uh, help you. Uh, like, like Moloch has gone too far. Right. Right. And so like the only, my the only model, path out is a, is a financial crisis. <clears throat> the only path out is a financial crisis where the collateral, the slaves uh -huh. are liberated at gunpoint, you know, uh, right. like that's the only way out of that system. Like it's, it, you know. It, it, it can't stop itself. Right. And and so, like, the mental model, like, is, you know, that comes out of that is, like, mm, sometimes wars have to be fought to end Ponzi's. Right. You know? Oh, shit. <laughs> I, think I, I think I see where this is going. You might see where this is going. Uh, yeah. Because then it's like, huh, do we as Americans <laughs> have the political and moral will to end the dollar Ponzi within the United States? Uh, because if we don't, then like, we should expect that people will try to end it for us. <laughs> and that's going to look like war. And we probably deserve that war, you know, because it's not like we were going to do it ourselves. Right. That's like an mm -hmm. awkward conclusion to come to uh, as a good guy. Right. <laughs> 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 Okay, you know? <laughs> so what what is this metaphor here? So like, there's a ton of debt out there, and we have been yeah. printing dollars to pay for like, you know, cheap Chinese goods and paying for cheap Philip, uh, you know, Philippine labor. Like, wh who are the who are the who are the like the if we've been printing this dollar and like who are the who are the people that really want the system to end? So everybody that isn't the United States that has to use the dollars like. Uh, like doesn't benefit from their own seniorage as much as they could, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like to the extent that like we go, you know, blow up a rock or something, we sort of like, you know, like to the extent that the dollar is a do dominant reserve currency, like we have uh, exorbitant privilege with our seniorage, our printing uh, has a much larger market to absorb, uh, you know, our printing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're sort of taking that value from every other country, uh, you know, uh, that would otherwise be benefiting from their own seniorage uh, in an increased capacity. Um, but of course, it also, you know, it's, it's more about the strategic rivals, right? Like Russia and China uh, want to, you know, they're promoting transacting using the renminbi and the, the Russian currencies. Um, so, yeah, uh, <clears throat> like... Yeah, pe people also say, like, there is no alternative. Like, what else would you do? Right. right. Um, and I think that's, like, like the thing that you else would, like, the other thing you would do is, like, not invade Iraq to prop up the dollar. You know, like, uh, you would just allow the dollar <laughs> to, like, not. Lose value. Uh, yeah. yeah. You just, like, be okay with some, you know, probably uh, serious loss in purchasing power, which would look like, you know, high inflation for a while. Um, right. But at the end of it, you know, like, like a fair system has America extracting as much value from the global market as it has actually earned with, you know, its contribution to the market, not mm -hmm. uh, like over and above its contribution to the market because it's extracting, you know, a rent for basically the rest of the world using dollars as the currency uh, and the American, you know, financial system. So like the the allowing the dollar to inflate if we hadn't invaded Iraq sounds like okay we'll throw up the flag and just we won't let this Ponzi perpetuate but instead we chose the path where we kick the can down the road because we want the Ponzi to perpetuate as long as possible. Well, so this is the thing that's weird, right? It's like why did we invade Iraq? You know, like like this is what we were saying about voting and coercion and like democracy and it's like you know, I didn't vote to invade Iraq. Uh, everybody who was in favor of invading Iraq lied about it. They said there were weapons of mass destruction. They printed it in the New York Times. We believed it. They said, I, like, I remember I was 10. I, I saw, I listened to this on the news every day, weapons of mass destruction for years and years and nothing happened. Right. So like, who, you know, it's like maybe, right. The Russian people didn't invade, vote to invade Ukraine. Putin decided to, you know, invade Ukraine. Right. Maybe the American people didn't vote to invade Iraq, but like the pattern of maintaining the dollar dominance, uh, you know, as 
managed by the Federal Reserve is why we invaded Iraq. How is that different than me as a U.S. citizen be, being controlled by the Federal Reserve dictatorship? You know, uh, if, if, if hmm. like, if that is the pattern of war in this country, then, like, you know, like, <laughs> like, it's not like, we're, you know, somebody actually threatened America. Like, that was all lies. It was like they threatened the dollar Ponzi, and so we blew them up. Right. 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 So, like, that makes me feel like I'm living in a Fed dictatorship. Right. And then th this has been the question I've been waiting, kind of, like, circling around. Like, the the, the Jerry Brito, un unrelated to all this conversation, Jerry Brito, when I talked to him about, like, the tornado cash thing, which was one department out of the global, the, the larger United States government, one department, the Treasury banned tornado cash like it had nothing to do with the fda it had nothing to do with like congress it was just like one part of this broader machine and so he said he said the united states is not a monolith it was just this one and uh, part of this broader system that did this one thing but then if you like zoom all the way out and kind of get a little bit more you know uh, satellite view of like the whole entire incentive structure of the broader American system. Yes, the U.S. government is not a monolith. It is a modular set of inter interwoven agencies and representatives. But at an incentive level, you can talk about the nation state, both the United States, nation state, other nation states as a holistic system. And it works out like most of the time. As in, if you assume agency by a nation state, you can kind of predict what it's going to do as a whole. And that mm -hmm. is weird to me that you can do that, but it works pretty damn well a lot one of the of my, time. One of my favorite models for this is like, uh, some, so like democratic processes I, I model by being like, oh, wait, they react too late and then they overreact. Uh, so like if, if that's like all you knew about the United States, you could like model our COVID response pretty well. You know, uh, we're just going to pretend like it's not a problem and then we're going to shut everything down. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like you, you can often do that. And that's like typically our control system as like humans. Like when we think of like, oh, Moloch, you, you, you know, we like global warming. Right. <laughs> we're going to ignore it. Sick. And then we're going to overreact. And then it's going to be like austerity measures for everyone. <laughs> right. So it's like. It's pretty common. Like this, like it's a, like you you can model things using, like it just get like what kind of control system is this? Like what is what is the feedback you know response to uh, things that come up, and like yeah that helps you predict it. So holistically, like tribes, organizations, governments, they're not a monolith. They're independent parts. But they kind of have like agency, right? Like there's the um, uh, who wrote who wrote um, the Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes Leviathan, where like it's actually like all, all the interdependent parts are part of this like larger creature, and it's it's like the United States has agency because it has its own wants and desires and like desire to live, and it's really the dollar that I think is like one of the main things that needs to have value because as soon as the dollar goes to zero, the United States falls apart. And so it's like the dollar that's keeping things together. So it's like the dollar has its own like demand to live, desire to live. And it creates this incentive structure out of that demand. Um, so how, right. do, how, does that, how does that relate to the, the democracy ignores it and then, um, and then overreacts? How, does those, how do those things relate? Um, sure. So like, let me, let me try to apply that theory, right? It's like mm -hmm. um, maybe... Like, we don't see the, like, egregiousness of the U.S. dollar uh, right now, like, as citizens mm -hmm. within the country. So we ignore it, right? Um, in the same way that, like, it takes a while for us to, like, decide that slavery is worth fighting a war over, right? It has to, like, grow big enough and oppressive enough. Um, and so, like, maybe one day, you know, uh, we realize that like the way we're managing the dollar is like not great. Um, also, uh, I, I just want to like pull apart a couple things, right? Not liking the dollar and like not liking America are somewhat different. Um, mm. 
Like you could be a dollar Ponzi minimalist, right? And be like, we should not be, you know, have this reserve currency that we like try to prop up demand for artificially and like still like America and like be a U.S. citizen and like be a patriot even. In fact, I think it's patriotic to want a future for the U.S. that is separate from the dollar Ponzi that we're fighting wars to maintain. Uh, I think a better use of America's people, uh, you know, armed for like, <laughs> it's like not throwing them, you know, to, to help prop up the dollar Ponzi. But what do I know, right? Um, but like, may, you know, in the future, it could be that we like overreact, right? And then we are like, no country can operate the reserve currency, you know, and then we like, mm. uh, we, we go all in on uh, neutral reserve currencies or something and like we we start propping up Bitcoin or Ethereum uh, as like collateral. Um, that's like one. Uh, or it's like the, the you know, we ignore BTC and ETH for so long and then we overreact by like banning them completely, mm. right? Um, they're, they're both like outcomes that I think are, you know, possible for, for the government. Uh, the... The idea is to try and come up with systems that anticipate, you know, um, problems and like can work to overcome them. Well, the problem is that it's hard to get people to coordinate around doing that when it's like uh, not right. immediately apparent then that's that that's a problem, right? So uh, the the hope for things like Ethereum is that they can actually solve these global coordination problems. Like, why are we fighting over like the world is on fire? You know, like. Uh, we have a global c climate crisis, right? Like things are only going to get more scarce. Supply chains are only going to break down on their own. Like we could spend our, you know, effort to uh, try to solve some of these problems, you know, put our heads together, figure out how to clean water, clean air, you know, restore, restore things. But instead we're like fighting over Ukraine, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like... Uh, maybe one day there's like a, you know, radicalist environmentalist league or something, uh, and they like <laughs> have their own, uh, you know, proposals to like boycott things or like protest things or, you know, there's a bunch of people like sitting in the forest in Germany and they like wouldn't get down from the trees. So like they couldn't cut them down. Uh, that was pretty cool. You know, th th like things like that or, uh, get, you know, throwing wrenches in the, way of people destroying the environment although that's not great either because now you know we're de like everybody's dependent on russian gas and the reality is that like that's you know fueling the war in ukraine now it's like so even sometimes when you try to get away from these things they still come back and so to to tie a bow on this conversation how does ethereum fix all this uh, Ethereum fixes all this by inspiring people to try and think about how Ethereum fixes all this. Um, <laughs> and step one, obviously, uh, motivational equilibrium. Uh, but but I, I, I mean that like half jokingly, and I like I actually mean that uh, seriously too. Like there is now like things like VitaDAO uh, that's doing like longevity research on the blockchain, where they have like NFTs as like IP, and you can invest in that and help fund, you know, longevity things that you want. Um, like, okay. <laughs> it's going to sound, this is going to sound weird. Um, so like every empire is basically a join or die Ponzi. Uh, like yes. one of the funny uh, contracts uh, that like Athens, you know, as part of the Delian League made, I think it was uh, Isle of Lesbos. And this is pretty funny. Uh, maybe it was another one, but like, like the reason lesbos like lesbian it's like they basically like showed up to this island and were like you guys can join the league or we'll kill you all uh and they were like we will not join the league and they were like fuck it uh you know we're we're going to climb the walls kill all the men sell everybody to slavery and like uh sell all the women to slavery uh and like lesbos has no more men and that's why it's lesbos <laughs> um but like you know uh, what happens when somebody puts a join or die Ponzi on chain? Hmm. Like, what if the join or die Ponzi on chain is like more efficient than uh, 
the way empires work. <laughs> like the the thing that citizenship sells you, uh, like like in the in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs of citizenship, the base level is deterrence, right? Like I agree to be a citizen of the United States because like if I go somewhere and somebody hurts me, like the, you know they'll maybe get hurt worse, right? Uh, like it means something to me. I feel safe and protected, you know, domestically mm -hmm. and abroad, right? Uh, and so like your, your main like service, your main offer as a nation state is deterrence. So like when I think of Coca-Cola, you know, I see like sugar water. When I think of a nation state, I think of like an assassination guild with a public goods department, right? You're like, like imagine trying to operate a nation state without an assassination guild, you know, uh, <laughs> like you're gonna have a really hard time doing any deterrence. You mean a you mean a monopoly on violence? <laughs> that's that's another way of uh, describing yeah. it. That's why uh, that's how yeah. we've described it on Bankless before. Yeah, monopoly on violence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's it's like um, it's just like one of those things. Like if if like I could see you know uh, citizenship being disrupted, for example, uh, if somebody can offer deterrence as a service more cheaply, right? Uh, mm -hmm. if I join some thing and like, now I know that, you know, I'm protected in this way, like, yeah, I'll maybe pay for it a little extra or something, but, um, you know, like that's the number one reason. And it's like, maybe you don't need to operate this like massive expensive infrastructure in order to like operate it, you know, deterrent in 2022, like maybe it's a lot cheaper. Uh, now I don't think we're going to see any of that anytime soon. Uh, I don't think we're going to see like <laughs> join or die Ponzi's where people are like, you know, you have this option, but like, uh, I'm kind of afraid of it. Um, uh, because okay. like the, you know, the, like when we talk about beating Moloch, we talk about like these coordination systems, like what if we unleash, you know, an even better coordination system, okay. right? Something, something like, you know, religion, which I'm like sort of diametrically opposed, opposed to given you know, my upbringing, uh, you know, sort of had Islamic fundamentalist father who fought a lot. Um, but it's like religion's like what you get when you solve Moloch for your system, right? right. Like, uh, I want the males to not infight over the women. Uh, and so we're going to make a bunch of rules to like manage our conflict internally. Uh, and now like we're a really, you know, like highly coordinated and like more trusting society. And that gives us the opportunity to like go take everyone else over and impose our, you know, God Ponzi on them and like the way we do things on them. And so it's like, you know, from the inside looking in, you're like, oh man, how do I solve this problem of like these monkeys just like fighting over, you know, breeding rights and like resources, resources and shit. Yeah. Yeah. And like fucking killing each other over this shit and like the fuck animals, you know, and then uh, and then you make some like crazy rule book and you kill everybody who doesn't uh, enforce it. And then you end up with this like God Ponzi that lasts 2000 years. <laughs> uh, and, and so I think, uh, I think maybe there's like positive Ponzi's uh, that like we should be optimistic for. Uh, that it's like, you know, join and thrive or something like uh, live and let live Ponzi. <laughs> right, right, um, right, right. Right. And like that's <laughs> uh, that's what we should be trying to help promote um, is like I agree to like, I don't know, like I agree to not pay taxes would be funny uh, like as a commitment device. You know, uh, I'm not advocating for that. I think paying taxes is important. I just think like if you end up at the point that you're like, okay, the government's just blowing shit up and like not saving the world. Like mm -hmm. we need to be saving the world, uh, government. Like <laughs> I'm now boycott, you know, like, right. um, like being able to coordinate, you know, activism, boycotts, uh, movements, um, to, to try and make our systems more accurately reflect our values instead of like, our systems just being Ponzi's that sustain themselves indefinitely, even when they are opposed to our values is like, uh, the idea, maybe more things need a rage quit. You know, it's like every system that like starts out useful and it like ends up scam everything. It's like exists on a spectrum of like useful and scam. Right. And like mm -hmm. at the beginning of its life, it's like useful. The end of its life is scam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's why that we need that, you know, 
the destructive creativity uh, to burn down some of these like scams that have outlived their usefulness in 2022. Uh, so, well, anyways. I mean, I hope uh, I hope people's uh, imaginations have been expanded to uh, what it is we're actually doing here, uh, why things are Ponzi's all the way down, and how it's also just coordination. So thank you for telling me, uh, helping me tell this very creative story. Thanks for having me. We always come up with something new when we do this. Uh, it's always fun talking to you, David. Appreciate mm, your contributions to the space and helping educate everybody and raising the army to slay Moloch. Well, uh, as the, the lead general of that <laughs> army, uh, I've been following you for a while, uh, and I'll continue to follow you into this very weird world that eventually people always seem to catch up to you on. I've been inspired by how much I've been able to learn from the people that uh, I helped inspire. So... <laughs> It's two way streets. Cheers, I mean. <laughs> Thanks, David. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.